Hello guys, welcome back to another installment of Trey the Explainer. Hope you're doing well. September, essentially just last week, depending on when this video comes out, has been rather interesting as far as scientific discoveries are concerned. In this video, I'll be highlighting and discussing three studies that came out very recently that I personally found most fascinating and intriguing, with the hopes you guys will think the same. Alrighty, without further ado, let's get to the science update. Loch Ness eDNA Back in December, I created a video discussing the advancements involving the use of DNA in identifying undiscovered organisms, specifically cryptids like Bigfoot, sea monsters, and probably most significantly in this story, the Loch Ness Monster. I referenced an at-the-time ongoing study using the relatively new method of environmental DNA, or eDNA for short, which is a DNA recovery and identification technique that uses DNA sloughed off into the environment from organisms that live in the region, like through skin cells, blood, urine, feces, and so on. The study conducted by various universities sought to use eDNA to possibly identify the notorious Loch Ness Monster which, if exists or existed in the lock, would likely leave eDNA traces that could be identified by the scientists as unknown, likely reptile DNA, and thereby prove the existence of the monster once and for all. You guys and myself were patiently awaiting the results, which I erroneously claimed would come out in January 2019. Well, after hundreds of samples, 500 million sequences, and several months, the results were published on September 6th and found some pretty neat stuff. DNA traces of many, many species were found in the samples, from microscopic protists to large animals. Of the animal species, the study identified a total of 11 species of fish, 3 species of amphibian, 22 species of birds, and 19 mammals, the vast majority being species that were already known to exist in the region and were to be expected in the results. Dogs, sheep, cattle, humans, deer, rabbits, badgers, voles, and many species of birds. These results further validates using eDNA for surveying the makeup and health of natural ecosystems without actually seeing the organisms in these ecosystems themselves. But who cares about that? So, is there actually a monster in the lock? Well, maybe. It's complicated. Many of the candidate species for a Loch Ness monster, a late surviving plesiosaur, a Greenland shark, a giant catfish, a sturgeon, can all be completely ruled out. No shark DNA, no catfish DNA, no sturgeon DNA, no seal or otter DNA, and no DNA from any reptile species was found living in Loch Ness. As the leader of the study said, I think we can be fairly sure that there is probably not a giant scaly reptile swimming around in Loch Ness. So, sorry folks, we do not have any evidence to suggest a late surviving plesiosaur living in the loch. But one curious thing we do have is a lot of evidence of eels. Yes, eels. One of the 11 species of fish discovered was that of the European eel, and from the research, there are a lot of them in the Loch Ness. The researchers suggest this might be due to either a small population of very large eels, or a large population of rather small eels living in the loch. Either way, it is possible to suggest that from the research, the supposed Loch Ness monster, if there ever was one, was likely an eel maybe a population of eels of abnormal size, being responsible for some of the sightings of the large serpentine creature Nessie. I think, in the bigger context of things, the overarching results of the Loch Ness eDNA study suggest what I will call the death of cryptids is upon us. The fact we can gather DNA and identify almost all the living organisms in the entire ecosystem without even seeing these creatures is amazing on its own, and means there is almost no more places to hide for elusive monsters like Bigfoot or the Yeti or Mothman. If they truly exist, we should expect to find their eDNA in their ecosystems. This study, I think, was essentially the nail in the coffin for a truly mysterious Loch Ness Monster. I feel like at this point, if we can't find evidence of a monster now, well, odds are we never will. Where is he? Why is he so, so darn hard to find even the slightest bit of evidence for? See Carl Sagan's The Dragon in My Garage for an illustration of this principle. It is interesting to think that this same eDNA method could be repeated in other locations and regions where different cryptids can supposedly be found. We live in an interesting time, my friends, where there is no more room for monsters. Say whatever you want about that. Poop knives. Oh gosh, I'm not sure if I can even do this study justice, so here's the title. Experimental replication shows knives manufactured from frozen human feces do not work. Yep. This is not a joke. This is an actual scientific paper that got through peer review and was published by a reputable journal. 
and it's as goofy and bizarre as it sounds. Experimental archaeology is a subfield of archaeology that focuses primarily on replicating and testing ancient tools and technology in the modern day to ascertain an approximation of their practicality. For example, archaeologists replicated 3,000-year-old fish hooks found at the Hoko River site in Washington. The scientists experimented with these replicated hooks to see if they could actually function well at catching fish. It was found that the fish hooks functioned pretty darn good at catching fish characteristic of the region, confirming their practicality and illustrating that the culture they belonged to was skilled at such a lifestyle. Other archaeologists have tried to replicate the construction and movement of monoliths like the Easter Island heads using means that would be available to the cultures that produced them at the time, with amazing results. Take that, ancient aliens. Experimental archaeology in many cases can yield just as important and interesting results as the typical fields of archaeology and anthropology. Well, and no more is this apparent than with this study from the Anthropology Department of Kent University, the Department of Archaeology at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, which created and tested tools fashioned from frozen human feces. The researchers' own feces, in fact. Why might these scientists do this, you might ask? Well, it all goes back to an ethnographer or cultural anthropologist account of the Inuit culture back in 1998. In his book, Shadows in the Sun, anthropologist Wayne Davis records a secondary account of an old Inuit man who, during an icy blizzard, in no tools at his disposal, defecated into his hand, sharpened his own poop into a blade, and let the blade freeze and harden, only to use it as a knife to butcher a dog, and I quote, Using its ribcage as a sled and its hide to harness another dog, he disappeared into the darkness. Jeez. The account has become famous in the anthropology community and has been repeated many, many, many times over. Wade Davis reportedly gathered the story from an Inuit man named... Uh, I'll butcher that anyway, so it just is spelt like this. Who claimed his grandfather had been the old man from the story in the 1950s. Davis has expressed doubt with the story's authenticity, suggesting it might have been a joke, but he believes it might have some truth to it. Citing Danish explorer Peter Fortune, who allegedly created a shovel out of his own feces to dig his way out of an avalanche. Keep in mind, there is no evidence of this event other than the account of Peter himself. Point being, the researchers in 2019 wanted to test and verify if it were possible for frozen human feces to be fashioned into a blade and successfully used as a cutting tool of meat. You know, for science. Keeping a detailed, and I mean detailed, log of the various foods they ate, double cheeseburger and onion rings, butternut squash risotto, the anthropologists then gathered their poop, cast it into a mold or hand sharpened it into a knife, and then froze it all of which were done in a variation of ways involving dry ice, refrigeration, and so on at different temperatures. With the fecal, fecal knives, knives, their word, not mine, hardened and ready to use, they tried cutting the hides and skins of pigs as a test. Now, the question you might be asking, did it work? No. The answer is no. I quote, Knives, knives failed, failed to, to cut, cut or slice, slice the, pig the pig hide, hide leaving only streaks. Nice. The researchers noted that the fecal knives were horribly inefficient at cutting. The knives melted on contact with both the meat and the researchers thankfully gloved hands and deteriorated. This is something that has been observed in tools composed of ice in similar studies. You could say that it was a shitty knife. What am I doing? The researchers strongly suggest that their findings imply the original story told to and retold by Davis is apocryphal, and likely nothing more than a joke or a tall tale, and should not be retold as truth as it has been for decades. And as much as I like to make fun of this study, the underlining message of the need for anthropologists to test records and claims made by cultural anthropologists about other cultures through rumors, urban legends, and assumptions is an important one. All claims in science, however ridiculous, should be tested and double-checked for authenticity and verification to make certain our theories and models about the universe are as sturdy, supported, and accurate as possible. That's just science for you. Skeleton bros. And oof, this story. I just can't stay silent about the no-homo, gay, Roman skeleton story. You know, as you do. 
I think we all saw the headlines consuming the story about two skeletons previously referred to as the lovers of Modena, or Modena, I'm not sure. These two skeletons, discovered in a late antiquity cemetery in Modena, Italy, described back in 2015, were assumed to be a male-female romantic pair, intentionally buried together, hand in hand, following their deaths. And there was a huge media storm focused on these two star-crossed lovers at the time of their discovery. However, various chemical analyses conducted and published by an Italian research team this September illustrated that these two skeletons were <gasps> both male. Quick, pull the plug before YouTube demonetizes this video for having gay stuff in- oh. This was shocking to some who had fallen in love with, no pun intended, the intentionally straight lover's interpretation. However, those who were excited about these two being revealed to be an example of an ancient homosexual couple were to be disappointed as well, with the authors of the study suggesting these two were likely brothers, or cousins, or relatives, or close friends, or soldiers who died alongside each other. According to news outlets, everything except a romantic couple. And I think somewhat justifiably, some people got a little riled up with the story, suggesting the archaeologists were ignoring the obvious and avoiding suggesting any gay or queerness in their conclusions about these skeletons, hence the no homo bro skeletons. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, but I have some experience with archaeoanthropology and might be able to help explain what's up with this story. There's a lot to cover, so bear with me. Couple burials, especially ones buried intertwined, tangled, holding hands, and in suggestively romantic positions are not at all uncommon throughout history. We have dozens of similar burials, from the Neolithic in Italy, Greece, and Turkey, to the Bronze Age in Siberia, to the Middle Ages. The so-called lovers of Valdario, discovered in 2007 in San Giorgio, Italy, and dated to about 6,000 years old, illustrate a similar scene in which two individuals were buried intermingled and within each other's arms, to which our modern eyes appears like a lover's embrace. Subsequent studies showed that these two skeletons were male and female, both no older than 20 years old. Just like with the lovers of Modena, these two were assumed to be romantic partners. We also have the Hassanlu lovers, discovered back in 1972 in Iran, and dated to have died around 800 BCE. These two also appear to have died and been preserved in a manner that is suggestive of a romantic relationship again in our modern eyes, as the two appear to be almost kissing and intertwined in each other's arms. The sex of one of these individuals has been a point of contention for years. However, the analysis of the remains leans to both of these being males, one being younger, perhaps between 19 and 22 years old, while the other is older, perhaps between 30 to 35 years old. Archaeologists, upon learning this, somewhat like what happened with the Modena lovers, walked back the statement about these two being quote-unquote lovers, adding the possibility these might have been father and son, cousins, and so on, who died together. So, is there an archaeological bias to cover possibly gay relationships in antiquity? Well, it's complicated. As bioarchaeologist Christina Kilgrove puts it, there is a certain level of likely erroneous projecting going on here with all these burials, especially by popular culture and the press. Our compulsion to jump to romance between two individuals whenever there is hand-holding or close intimacy or burials may be wrong. We pick up on social cues that in our modern Western society tells us a romantic relationship. Hand-holding, spooning, kissing, caressing. But these are concepts of our modern Western society, and perhaps do not completely translate into the past. Heck, they don't even carry cross-culturally in the modern day. People like to say it was a different time, but really, we should say it was a different society with tons of different social norms, structures, morals, and so on, and applying our norms to these cultures may be anachronistic. The thing is that in archaeology, because we cannot talk to these people, or the people who buried them, it's downright impossible to ever truly know the extent of these relationships, or the intentions of the barriers. Lovers? Family members? Friends? We don't really know. We also have to be equal about everything, though. If we should not fully consider the Hassanlu remains to be lovers, then we should do the same to the Valdaro lovers, too. Are they brother and sister? Cousins? Close friends? Or lovers? We don't really know for certain right now. But I don't think we should split hairs, either. There does appear to be a bit of a double standard in archaeology regarding burials such as this. Male-female burials? There is often no doubt these individuals may have been sexual and or romantic partners. Male-male burials, though... Well, all of a sudden, they might have been just close friends or kin or... Some archaeologists in the past have been somewhat notorious for dancing around some findings. See women buried alongside weapons and military honors. Have a male buried alongside weapons and burial goods indicative of military service, and there's no contention he was some kind of warrior. 
have a woman buried alongside the same burial goods, and all of a sudden these are merely symbolic gestures to some. All of a sudden there is no way this woman actually fought in battles. I mean, she might have done those things. The reverse has happened as well, where a 16-year-old Siberian warrior princess all of a sudden is said to just be a normal teenage boy upon testing her DNA and finding out she was a he. This is a reality in archaeology. There's subtle double standards and assumptions all the time. I know archaeologists in the field who have directly experienced stuff like this, and it sucks, but I guess it is slightly to be expected and progress has been made over the past few decades. Something I will call the de-gain of history has been around for a while in society, where primarily Western and Christian researchers tend to downplay the fact that societies and cultures throughout history most definitely did not hold the same values as our own, and this is especially true towards sexuality. There are people out there who are like, Alexander and Ophistian or Bagoas were only friends, yo, completely ignoring the somewhat obvious historical evidence implying the contrary. We know now that homosexual relationships were by no means rare in the ancient world, and societies dealt with sexual relationships in their own different ways. Ways different than our own. The Hassanlu lovers might have been a homosexual couple. We don't know, though, and probably will never truly know. If we ever get DNA evidence, that might clarify things, but if it comes back as not father and son or related, we are back at square one. The scientists in the case of the Hassanlu lovers, I think, have rightfully explained it is a very real possibility the relationship between these two might have been romantic, but it very well might not have been. We don't know based on the current evidence yet, and that's how conclusions in science should work. In the case of the lovers of Modena, I think the press are primarily at fault for turning this into the circus it has become. A homosexual relationship between these two seems somewhat unlikely, and the authors give their logic for this in the paper. Keep in mind, these skeletons are late Roman, 4th to 6th centuries CE, or AD, not the prior, more lenient centuries as some media outlets have mistaken. The empire was largely Christian, and homosexuality was passively, if not fully, criminalized at this point in history in the region. So, an explicitly public homosexual burial performed by a likely anti-gay Christian community seems improbable. Thus, the alternative suggestions of two soldiers or relatives by the authors. A homosexual relationship is not impossible, though, and the authors didn't fully rule out this possibility of these two being an exception to their societies. The problem is that most media outlets didn't say this, and thus people assume the scientists were being unfairly biased. I think perhaps calling these kinds of burials the lovers is a misnomer, and a shameless attempt to garner interest to a story rather than getting the facts straight. Calling these lovers carries about as much weight as calling these the Venus figurines, in reality, we have no idea what relationships or significance they bore in life for these peoples. As with many, many previous cases, the majority of the time, the press and disseminating science to the masses are to blame for overemphasizing, underemphasizing, and straight up misinterpreting findings and discoveries, and thus the current predicament we have found ourselves in with the Italian skeleton bros. But I hope my explanation has helped a little bit here. Anyways, thank you so much for watching my rather different September science update. I hope you enjoyed these three scientific stories I found interesting. I've been Trey the Explainer, and thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for more videos. Goodbye. All the world loves a lover. All the girls in every land a man to know. Joy of loving is to live. In the world of man, dumb. <laughs>